yesterday afternoon, um, we had left off uh, with Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. Um, Pat, if you could take it away. Good morning. For the record, my name is Pat Jones, Director of Health System Finance with the Green Mountain Care Board. Just a quick recap on what um, transpired yesterday. The board voted um, on budgets for seven hospitals. Today we'll um, discuss Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, Northwestern Medical Center, Springfield Hospital, and then the three UVM Health Network Hospitals, Central Vermont, Porter, and University of Vermont. So we'll start with um, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. Uh, they um, have come in with a uh, proposed budget of uh, almost 81 million. They represent about 3.1% of the system total. They do have a physician transfer adjustment and that brings their NPR growth down to 4.8% should the board approve that adjustment. Um, they do, in fact, uh, offer health care reform investments at the amount of 0.4% of their MPR, and their fiscal year 19 rate request is 4% with 1% uh, valued at just over 384000 So. Um, it, preliminary decisions were made with regard to Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. The adjustment to the fiscal year 18 base, um, the staff recommended uh, accepting that and the board's preliminary decision was to do so as well. Healthcare reform investments the same. Uh, staff recommended acceptance. The board's preliminary decision was to do so as well. The NPR growth rate, um, again, with that adjustment is at 4.8%. And um, the options there are to accept that um, rate of growth or to um, reduce it. The commercial rate increase at 4%, the same options, accept or reduce. A uh, um, significant update for this hospital is that since we met last week, um, they, their board um, voted and they are planning to participate in the ACO Medicaid program for 2019. So that's um, a significant update. If um, you were to reduce their rate from 4% to 3%, the estimated MPR growth would become um, approximately 4.3% as opposed to the 4.8%. So I'll stop there and um, let you ask questions or discuss. Thank you, Pat. Are there questions for Pat? As I uh, look at the notes from last week, it uh, looks like the, the board uh, was tentatively focusing on a 25 to 3% range. Does anyone wish to make a motion or have any discussion? I would say that I, I'll start. Uh, I'd be at the higher end of that range, uh, given that they are now participating in the ACO and the Medicaid for all the reasons we talked about yesterday, giving them some operational room to implement the shift from deeper service to is still going to be above our uh, guidance at that point, even at 3%, 4.3%, but given the demographics in their area, given that they are likely probably having some New Hampshire revenue in that NPR, and given their movement into the ACO, I'd be comfortable with the higher end of that range, so 3%. Does anybody wish to make a motion? I'll make a motion. I will move that we adjustment to the base for the provider acquisitions and the health care reform investments. Is there a second? Second. So the motion is to set the NPR at 4.3%, commercial rate at 3%, to accept the adjustment to the fiscal year 18 base of 
$1,700 and to accept the health care reform investment of $300,000. Is there discussion? Um, yeah, the only discussion I would have is I, I was at 2.5 before, but I as well would go to 3% because they're participating in the ACO. Um, I do think this is a hospital we have to watch as far as the NPR growth because they've had uh, consistently over the 3% for the past couple of years. Um, and I, I think it's actually, whether it's New Hampshire residents coming in or it's Vermont people coming back, <laughs> I, think, I think we may have lost Vermonters out and they're coming back. But you know, either way, that's what's driving the growth. So it, it, is, it is something we'll have to watch for this hospital, but I do agree with the 3% now. other discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the next one, Pat, is Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Um, they are coming in with a budget of almost 84 million. There's a number of hospitals that are in, uh, in the same uh, range, 3.2% of the system total. Uh, they had um, recommended an adjustment due to um, the, uh, an inadvertent decrease of their uh, NPR last year. Uh, the board uh, preliminarily agreed that that adjustment should be made. So their NPR growth rate with the proposed adjustment would be 4.8%. They also um, indicated that they had health care reform investments that exceeded the 0.4% allowance. They are, uh, you know, one of the smaller hospitals that is participating in all three ACO programs in 18, and indications are that they will do so again in 19. Their fiscal year 19 rate request is 4.9%. The estimated value of 1% is uh, 392000 so uh, four decisions for the board here as well. Uh, the adjustment to the fiscal year 18 base, uh, preliminary decision was to accept that. Healthcare reform investments here. Um, there was one investment that they indicated um, that was the hiring of a neurologist and the staff did not um, see the direct link uh, to healthcare reform for that investment, but staff uh, recommends uh, uh, allowing the remaining and even with taking the neurologist out of the healthcare reform investment amount, um, they still would reach that 0.4% allowance. So we recommend that you um, accept those. NPR growth rate, um, again, 4.8% with the adjustment, the options are to accept or reduce that. And the rate, the commercial rate increase at 4.9%. If that were um, reduced, to 3.9%, the estimated MPR growth would be 4.2%. Couple of items I um, would just like to point out. Um, one is that reducing, uh, Brattleboro, as you can see, has an operating margin in fiscal year 19 of um, just 0.3% projected in their budget. Um, so if they were unable to identify, um, you know, some uh, spending cuts, reducing would um, re potentially result in a negative operating margin. Um, obviously, the expectation would be that they um, find some um, ways to cut expenses. The other thing I just wanted to note is that um, this particular hospital, when you look at their charges on the Vermont Department of Health website, they, um, they definitely come in as one that, you know, virtually all, most of their charges are below the state average. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Focusing on a range between 3.4 and 4. Um, are there any questions for the hospital budget team? Is there any discussion? I actually would just like to say that I, um, for 
Brattleboro, I have changed my mind in this week um, to the extent that they are all in. They were all in last year. They're going to be all in again. And they are currently with operating losses and projected deficits. I am concerned about the reducing their commercial rate such to the point where they might have a negative operating margin. That concerns me. Um, they do have days cash on hand. There's that little cushion there, but uh, I would be voting against Um, yeah, I have a little different perspective on that. I'm definitely concerned about this this hospital. I would also um, put this in the category of Copley as a hospital we should be bringing back in. They've been showing losses uh, for the past, you know, 2017 at operating loss of 2.4, 18 they're now looking at an op operating loss of 2 million, uh, 19 they they're coming in with a 254, um, you know, showing a 254 that most likely that will turn to an operating loss. But the reason I you know, I say that too, is they're trying to fix this by rate. So they're actually taking a commercial, 7% commercial rate across most all categories. And last year they asked for a similar high rate increase. They need to change how they're doing their business and get in control of their expenses in line with what their revenue is. They're also showing if we look at what this forecast is, a 7% growth, 6.8% growth over their current projection. Um, you know, we did say they could adjust to the the issue we had last year, where where we maybe had, you know they had, they had an understated NPR, but they really don't need it. They're coming in on their budget, their original budget. So, you know, this this one is a hospital in trouble, and you know I understand what you're saying, Jess. If we if we you know cut their rate, it could put them in deeper trouble, but I also want to push that they need to change how they're running their business. They, they you know, been, have been doing this for several years. Their utilization is down, and they're putting in high increases. So I had been at a 3.5%, which would give them 5% across the board on the things that they're requesting increases for. You know, I don't know how we fix it, and, you know, whether or not we end up, you know, not cutting rate and giving them another year, but, you um, there, it, it doesn't work to keep losing well, money and to keep running. And, and I believe right now their NPR estimates are too high, even with you know giving them a 4.8 percent increase over their this adjusted budget number. They're not going to hit that. Um, I don't believe because they're not getting the increases. And we're going to be back here next year, even if we give them the 4.9 percent. I would believe on this one we're back here next year with them at a two million dollar loss unless they change what they're doing. I, let me just follow up with that. I can appreciate that, Maureen, but one of the things I think we have to take into account is everybody is not starting with the same base of charges. And so the fact that they are pricing their services, at least on the charge master, below the average, for me, gives them a little bit of room to say, okay, this year perhaps you can increase your prices to some extent, basically, because to offset some of these operating losses and deficits, I agree with you that perhaps we need to think about how they do their business model. They are all in. They are switching gears from fee-for-service into fixed payments, and I think it's going to take some transition time. But since their prices are not already above the state average, I'm willing to give them some wiggle room there. So I think what we don't know enough about, and I, I understand the price part, but whether their discount off those rates is lower, you know, because when you know when most hospitals are getting reimbursement at 30 percent or so for Medicaid and Medicare and 70 percent maybe for um, commercial you know we'd have to really look at that so I you know it's like what's what are people really paying so it's hard to say um, I just have a real concern of giving high rates and letting them continue on this path I, when they were here I said they're in trouble what can we do to help I don't think fixing it is just <laughs> increasing rates so I think where I'm I'm Sort of in between, I would say, Maureen and Jess, I would um, I would cut the NPR growth rate because, to Maureen's point, it they are almost seven percent below their from projected to budget, eighteen projected to nineteen budget. But I would leave the rate for the reasons that Jess articulated, um, particularly given that this isn't a critical access hospital, which means they have a less like their Medicare reimbursement is. Is, isn't as protective um, or as volatile, but still. Um, and 
uh, I do agree we should ask them to come in and monitor and push them on uh, the issues that you raised, Maureen. So that's how I would handle it. I would cut the, I don't have a number in my head for what to cut the NPR to, but I would cut it so that it's, less, since they're not gonna hit it anyway, and it's high, uh, I would cut the NPR, keep the rate, and bring them in. Tom, you didn't weigh in last week. Are you prepared this week? Well, this one is, uh, confuses me a bit. Um, I think where I end up is that uh, I would leave the NPR alone, um, that if they earned it, great, and I think there's some potential for them to do that, uh, given their, their payer mix, which I'll get into in a second. Um, and I would, uh, in order to give a, a message to them that their spending trends have been excessive over the last four or five years, uh, cut the rate by just one point, which is uh, $392,000. I look at their um, request for um, uh, the requested increase, and they are looking for a 29% increase uh, in their commercial revenues from 32.2 million to 41.7. They are basically flatlining their Medicaid revenues from 10.3 million to 10.4 million, even though 41% of their NPR base uh, is Medicaid and they're actually looking for a drop in their Medicare uh, revenues of $4.3 million from 35.6 to 31.3. And I, you know, I, I'm not close enough to the ground to, to um, totally understand that, but it seems that there is some upside potential in Medicare and Medicaid, and if they achieve that, I would give it all to them because they need it. But in order to send a message that, uh, as Maureen has made the point, that this, uh, uh, kind of going to rate increases uh, uh, in order to uh, <clears throat> survive another day uh, is something that uh, the board is aware of and is not encouraging. So I would, I would uh, support um, the minimal in, uh, decrease in NPR or no increase in NPR uh, request at all, but a 1% rate reduction uh, uh, um, to give the message that cost shifting this onto the commercial insurers, which is what their plan um, outlines uh, is is not the best way to travel. Just to weigh in, um, I haven't changed my position from last week. I was at 3.9 percent for a commercial rate. I do think the NPR should be dropped down to at least 3.8 percent. And so this one, uh, there's some variance here. And uh, is anyone prepared to make a motion? I'll, I'll move that we uh, leave the NPR uh, as requested and that we cut the, the rate uh, to 3.9 percent. Is there a second? <clears throat> so hearing no second, would somebody like to make an alternative motion? I'll move that we make the NPR go 3.2 percent and we go to commercial rate of 3.9 percent. Is there a second? I, I can second that because uh, there is another bite of the apple if their NPR does, um, if, if they are successful in bringing in their NPR, um, uh, you know, next spring when we when we review these. So, um, and I'm happy with the 3.9 percent rate cut message. I just want to remind. I'm not sure if everybody remembers, but this is the hospital that had tremendous access issues um, with healthcare. They had new patient appointments of 120 days for uh, some of their primary care services, and so they brought a bunch of family practices on board, and so part of the NPR growth is delivering care more appropriately, particularly primary care, which is the kind of NPR growth we want to see. So. Okay, is there further discussion? If not, I believe I understand the motion to be to set the, the rate increase at 3.9%, the NPR at 3.2%, health care reform investment at 776000 and restore the fiscal year 18 NPR reduction of $1,323,198. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. So that was a three to two vote. 
The next hospital is Northwestern Vermont Medical Center. Their budget request is uh, almost 113 million. They're 4.3 percent of the system total. They um, had recommended a number of adjustments related to physician transfers, and um, we were able to obtain more information on those requests, which I'll share with you in a moment. If you were to accept those adjustments, their NPR growth rate would be 3.2%. They did um, suggest health care reform investments at the 0.4% allowance, which the staff is recommending acceptance of. They are another hospital that's um, been participating in all three ACO programs in 18, and indications are that they will do so in 19 as well. Their fiscal year 19 rate request is the lowest of all hospitals this year um, at 2%, and the estimated value of a 1% rate increase is almost 530,000. Um, so the adjustment to the base, um, we had, um, it, there's already been approval for the 1.7 million in the occupational health um, transfer, and the staff had recommended that you accept that um, last week. We are recommending acceptance of the remaining three um, transfers as well. They are for um, a surgeon. There's an independent surgeon who's retiring this month, and NMC has been able to hire a surgeon to replace him. Um, and that is now hospital employed. ENT services, there was a retirement a while ago and there have been some um, access challenges in the ENT world and um, NMC has been able to successfully um, recruit an ENT. Um, that um, person is starting this month as well. And then neurology services, that was the one that um, we had the most question about. Um, there, there is, you know, a wait time, I think, of about a month for um, neurology services up in St. Albans. Um, but we, a, a couple of board members had raised the issue of is this a new service. Um, what, it, what is happening with the neurology services that uh, UVM will be sending a neurologist one day a week to St. Albans. And um, so I spoke with both um, NMC and UVM, and with that um, neurologist coming to St. Albans, revenues will um, decline accordingly at um, UVM because that person won't be practicing at, um, at UVM that one day a week. So we are comfortable with, um, with recommending approval of all three of these transfers. In terms of healthcare reform investments, again, the staff uh, recommended approval and you all made a preliminary decision last week to, um, to accept that recommendation. NPR growth with the adjustments comes in at the board's target in the guidance at 3.2%. The staff recommends acceptance of that. Commercial rate increase at 2%. Again, the lowest in the system this year, and the staff recommends acceptance of that. So as I look at the notes from last week, it looks like four of the five board members had um, tentatively um, accepted the staff recommendations. Um, is there any questions for staff or any discussion? been moved and seconded to um, accept the uh, provider acquisition of 3,249,654 healthcare reform investments of $424,513 to uh, accept the NPR growth rate uh, combined 
and the rate increase of 2%. Is there any discussion? Tom? Um, I'm going to support this, but I, I just want to note that um, of the requested increase, 90% of it is falling to the commercial payer. Uh, 17 is a 17.9% reduction in expected Medicaid revenues and a 27% increase in Medicare revenues. Um, and this is on top of a five-year uh, expenditure trend of 6.2%. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the hospital's proposal is reasonable and fair, but there are some red flags uh, kind of uh, um, in the numbers that uh, uh, w we should watch as time goes on. I appreciate those comments, Tom, and as I've said to you before, it's kind of hard to call it an all-payer model when not all payers pay. I'll leave it at that. Any further discussion? That motto was uh, branded into my brain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So let the record know that was a unanimous decision. The next one, I believe, is Springfield. That's correct. Springfield comes in with a fiscal year 19 proposed budget of uh, just under 60 million. They represent 2.3 of the system total. Their NPR growth is um, at 1%. They did not request um, health care reform investments. Um, and since they're well under the target, they um, are not needed. They are one of the hospitals that is participating in all three ACO programs in 18. I should have mentioned that about uh, Northwestern as well. Um, and all indications are, are that they will do so again in 19. Their fiscal year 19 rate request is 5%, and the estimated value of a 1% rate increase is 319,000. So um, last week, so the two, two decision points here are regarding the growth rate for MPR and the commercial rate increase. And uh, the preliminary um, decisions last week were um, to reduce the commercial rate to 4%, um, a note that that's um, about 40, just under 40% of their operating margin. And then their um, estimated MPR growth rate if the NPR were to be reduced according to the rate increase reduction, would be a 0.5% of, um, of NPR growth. Are there questions of the staff? So for my notes, uh, last week, Pat, I had um, decision on the 4% rate. I do not see where there was any discussion on NPR. Um, any discussion? I've changed my mind a little bit on Springfield since last week. Um, again, because small critical <coughs> access, uh, terrible demographics that they're struggling with, including the opioid ep epidemic, all in on the ACO for all three programs. Um, it does, and I would appreciate Maureen's thoughts on this, it does look like they are uh, one of the hospitals where their growth, they're at 5% from projected to budget, so I could see some sort of adjustment in the NPR for that. Um, but I would either leave their rate alone or do a smaller decrease, particularly with the 40% of their margin being 1%. Sure, I'll add to that that um, I, I don't think they're necessarily gonna get their NPR growth, but it's only 1%, so I wouldn't necessarily cut that. Um, another hospital in trouble, another one we should be bringing in uh, more frequently. They lost $3 million or $4 million in 2017. 
Um, their budget for 18 was to make a million. They're losing a million. Uh, last year we gave them a six and a half percent rate increase. I think we had similar conversations last year. We didn't cut their rate um, because they need to, to fix some things. Um, their budget is right 5% year over year. I don't know that they're going to get that increase. Um, I'm in for a rate cut to 3 to 4%. I, I just don't think we can, I almost think we're rewarding hospitals with, um, with high rate increases year over year when they need to change how they run their business. I understand their critical access. But there has to be changes made or we're just going to continue this. It's, it's not sustaining for a hospital to lose money year after year after year. And I think we need to force that conversation um, with some of these hospitals. And I, I know they're struggling and I, I want to work with them. Um, but I also think they need to realize that, you know, some of them said we, we put this rate increase just to make money, you know, just to make money. They're not talking about cost savings or changes. Um, so I'm okay with their NPR and, you know, I'm willing to maybe go to the higher end of the rate cut at 4%, but, you know, I think we need to work with these hospitals and make sure we're getting them in here and under, figure out how they're going to switch to making somewhat of a low margin at some point. Tom. <coughs> I, um, I generally agree with what Maureen has said. There are some uh, aspects, though, that kind of make me just um, to uh, you want to wish them well and, and not uh, uh, basically go with their request. And those things are that if you look at their uh, NPR trend um, and expense trend over the past five years, they've been very uh, meager. It's not like they're living year to year on on expansive growths in revenue and, and spending. Their NPR trend has been seven-tenths of 1% over the past five years, and their expense trend has been 2.3%. Um, in terms of their request uh, uh, for increase in NPR, um, it's very balanced uh, with 783,000 coming from commercial, 338,000 coming from Medicaid, um, and uh, um, 1.56 million, which is a 7.5 percent uh, increase in, in, in Medicare. So I'm, uh, you know, I think it is a hospital uh, that's in trouble. Um, I think that they uh, they need to find uh, new ways to um, uh, manage to, uh, toward their population. But I, I don't see, uh, you know, and, and and kind of cutting them would reduce an already very thin operating margin and, to, and, and uh, total margin. So um, it, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not inclined to uh, cut anything here. Does anyone wish to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we accept the uh, Springfield Hospital's proposed NPR growth rate Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Let the record note it was a four to one decision. Anyone who's motion sick should not look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I said anyone who has motion sickness should not look at the screen right now. Okay. Um, we are back to the University of Vermont Health Network Hospitals, which we um, discussed for the first time yesterday. Um, so we'll start again with Central Vermont Medical Center. They um, asked for some transfers. Um, there is the issue of the ACO accounting change, which you all discussed at some length yesterday. And there seemed to be a feeling that we should um, somehow adjust for that, whether it's in the 18 base 
for ascertaining MPR growth rate or um, making some changes to 19. Their fiscal year 19 proposed budget is at 211 million. They're 8.1 percent of the system total. Uh, NPR growth without um, any adjustments, 6.5, with the staff recommended adjust adjustments related to um, transfers, 6.3. And if um, we were to go with the account, the ACO accounting change, it would be um, in the neighborhood of 5% uh, NPR growth. They also requested health reform investments. And like all of the health network hospitals, they're participating in all three ACO programs in 18 and plan to do so as well in 19. Their fiscal year 19 rate request is at 2.8% um, with 1% of the commercial rate increase being worth about 675,000. I believe that yesterday, um, the and I ha we haven't updated these slides to reflect yesterday's discussion, but um, I, my recollection is that the board was leaning to accepting the adjustments, accepting the health care reform investments. Uh, in terms of NPR um, growth, and uh, commercial rate increase, I believe there was discussion and in fact even a motion made which was then withdrawn um, of a uh, potential 2.3% uh, rate increase if I'm remembering correctly. That's what I have in my notes as well. Are there any questions for the staff? Anybody like to make a motion? What I don't remember is what our discussion was from, uh, even though it was just yesterday, I actually don't remember <laughs> what we were discussing about NPR. Does anyone else remember? Was it the five with the 2.3 or was it reduced to NPR with so my recollection is that we, w we weren't reducing the NPR, but we were only talking about the rate. Yeah, I think well, the reason we had talked about not reducing the NPR is their, their concern when they came in, although I think they've revised it somewhat, is their 2018 is coming in hot, was coming in hot. Uh, they may have brought that, I think they came back in and brought that back down, although at the meeting they did still say it was 217 versus 212. So the change is 3.6% against their projection. So that was, you know, assuming their projection was correct. Um, I think some of the discussion we had on the rate was really related to the fact that they did, in fact, you know, they are, in fact, coming in hot, so they're asking for a higher amount, and do we reduce their rate? Um, this is another one, you know, I hoping that under the network they're going to be able to get their profitability aligned. They, they, they did lose $2 million in 17, and they're 18, although they're up on top line, um, they're still making money on the bottom line, but it's going the wrong way. So their top line increases are being more than offset by higher expenses, which is not what we want to see, right? If you go up by five on the top line, and your expenses go up by seven, that's a bit of a problem. So, um, you know, I'm, I think what we say, a two, I mean, I'm willing to, to take the NPR, put a motion for the NPR at 5% and commercial rate, I think we said was 2.3. Yes, and I think, uh, as I recall, Robin, the discussion really was about the fact that um, similar to Porter um, being part of the network, we're actually hopeful that people are being put in, in the uh, right settings mm -hmm. yep. in that, um, you know, we would want them to be in the more cost affordable setting than in the more expensive setting, and we'd also want them closer to their families and, and the, yep. their support group. So I think that's why we had tentatively left the uh, NPR.
PPR at the five. So I think that that's where I land with the NPR. I think the NPR, I'm fine with it, given that I think more care is being delivered in the community centers. And I'm also comfortable with the commercial rate increase of 2.8%. So that's where I would like to leave it, personally. So, can I, um, so in thinking about the rate increase, I, I think I said this yesterday for somebody, some hospital, but for me, like I would deal with the coming in hot as part of the enforcement. And so I, I understand that that obviously has a slower impact, um, but I think if we want to start enforcing things differently, we should address that in the enforcement guidance and um, so that there's like a clear path for that. So <coughs> I'm still thinking, but I, where I am on the commercial rate increase, but I'm probably where, I'll probably land where Jess is. Real-time thinking. Real-time thinking. I'll make a motion. We'll see how it flies. So I will move that we accept the adjustments to the base, as the staff recommended, uh, the, the uh, health care reform investments, that we allow the NPR growth rate to be 5% with the acquisition and ACO accounting adjustments, and the commercial rate is 2.8%. I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded. Um, I'll just say that uh, I agree with um, three out of the four pieces of the proposal, but I will be voting no to the final proposal because I do think that uh, the rate should be reduced by the half a point. So any other discussion? I, I just, I'm probably going to vote no on this too for a similar reason that um, uh, I think a rate reduction from 2.8% to 1.8% uh, that amounts to six hundred seventy-four thousand um, dollars, and 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 I look at that in the context of of their long-term spending trend, expense trend, which is uh, uh, five point four percent. And so uh, um, I, there's some very favorable things, though, in this proposal that their their payer mix proposal is is very well balanced. Um, they are not you know relying so much on commercial; they're expecting. Uh, increases in Medicaid uh, of 37 percent and Medicare of 18 percent, and I think that's a good thing. But I, I think the spending trend um, uh, <coughs> is a little excessive, um, and I, so I can support the the um, NPR increase because if they earn the revenue, then the, then they get to keep it. But uh, I, I think a, a modest reduction in, in the rates in, in the rate proposal uh, would be appropriate. Any other discussion? If not, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. Okay. I believe that the uh, motion has failed. Would someone wish to make a substitute motion? Um, I would make a motion for the 5% NPR and 2.3% uh, in the commercial rate. And would you also add the adjustments in the HCR investments? Uh, and the adjustments in the HCR. Is there a second? <coughs> second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. So let the record show that it was a three to two vote. I would just like to clarify um, regarding health care reform investments as well. I'm not sure that was covered in the motion. I believe it was. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next um, hospital is Porter. Um, there are um, some complexities here as well as we touched on yesterday. The uh, Proposed budget for Porter is um, almost 85 million. They're 3.3 percent of the system total. They're another one of those three percenters. There are a number of them. Um, the uh, they did um, request the adjustment, the same type of adjustment for the ACO accounting change that the other two network hospitals adjusted, and that you just. Um, 
voted to approve for CBMC. With that adjustment, their NPR growth would be 3.2%. Uh, they have requested health care reform investments as well at the 0.4% level. And again, they're participating in all three ACO programs. As with CBMC, their commercial rate um, increase is requested at 2.8%, and the value of 1% um, rate increase is 295,000. Um, so yesterday, um, we um, discussed all of these items, and another item that we discussed is this question of how Porter is accounting for its reserves. Um, Kelly, for reserves for downside risk um, related to participation with the um, ACO. Kelly yesterday had um, spoken to the fact that um, ACO accounting in general is new territory and there really aren't standards at this point around how to account for um, ACO related revenues, um, participation fees, expenses, and reserves related to downside risk. And um, I believe you all saw a letter from Porter and from the UVM Health Network, uh, two letters that came yesterday um, describing the rationale for why Porter is um, reserving for downside risk. So um, we spent some time thinking about this um, after yesterday's meeting, and I wanted to offer um, a, a suggestion and see if the board is open to that. Um, what the staff would recommend is that you um, approve the budget for 2019 for Porter that allows the hospital um, to net its reserve against down, for downside risk against its fixed prospective payments. That's how they submitted their budget. Um, but then that um, you also encourage Porter's staff to participate in discussions that our staff is planning to have um, after the budget review process is over, not only with Porter, but with other interested parties. So, and our goal of those discussions would be to um, develop guidance for fiscal year 20 um, for hospitals that would give us um, more standardization around how they account for ACO-related revenues, expenses, and reserves for downside risk. In addition, um, we think it, it would be wise to ask Porter to work with the GMCB staff uh, to keep the board informed about how um, their actual experience with downside risk is impacting their reserves as information becomes available about that so that you can have sort of a, a way of monitoring um, what's happening there. Now, you know, I'll say um, directly that final information on how hospitals are performing in terms of um, downside risk is reliant on claims lag. So for October through December of 18, the first quarter of the hospital's fiscal year, we won't have information on their financial performance until the third quarter of 19. And similarly, for January through September of 19, the remainder of the fiscal year that we're discussing here, we won't have information on their um, financial performance. We won't have final information until um, the third quarter of 2020. You know, there will be some interim information, but um, we really won't know for sure. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware that while um, monitoring is a possibility, um, it will not be final information until a ways down the road because of um, claims run out. So I'll, I'll um, put that out there. I can walk through 
Uh, the remainder of the items, or if you'd like to stop here, Chair Mullen, to discuss the reserve um, issue, I'll let, I'll let you determine that. I think uh, we really should uh, decide that issue first. And my understanding is the staff recommendation is to accept Porter's um, submission as is with that uh, adjustment. And um, are there questions of the staff or discussion on that item? Uh, you know, I guess just the question is, we, we certainly do need to resolve this. I mean, it, the, the number relative to the $2 million on $19 million um, is a significant percentage for a reserve, far higher than the risk quarters that I was at least understanding under the ACO that, you know, the maximum risk a hospital would be taking would be about a 3% up. So it, you know, if in fact this is the case, I think it bears for a lot of the hospitals who, who may be in the program if they really have to take such a, you know, such a high reserve. So I'm still really challenging the reserve calculation, but I don't believe we're gonna have it resolved and understood today, so I'm willing to accept it for this hospital, um, but I, you know, I'm definitely concerned of the implications of it in total and, and how do we, you know, look at this in the future and wish we had more time to resolve it beforehand, but there's a lot of inconsistencies in the way the ACO is being handled throughout the hospitals. I'm kind of in the same boat of reluctantly accepting it. I think we do have to get to the point where um, we have common, what I would call GMCB accounting standards. And I think I'm confident that the staff will be able to uh, work with CFOs around the state to uh, develop a, a proposal moving forward. So I, I would let it be. Um, Jess? Yeah, I agree. I, thank you for the staff recommendation. I think we it's clear that we have a lot to learn about ACO accounting um, in our hospital budget process. This is new territory. I don't want to be rash here. And so I think taking the time to figure it out over the next year and having standards for our next budget cycle will make the most sense. And I think at the end of the day, we want to be encouraging ACO participation. So we want to be, make sure that we're allowing for the type of risk reserving that is necessary. So I'm comfortable with the staff recommendation. And if the downside risk is not realized, we can adjust next year in the budget if that comes up. Is there further discussion? I'm fine. Would somebody like to make a motion? Everybody's in the jumping mood this morning. I can make a motion. I haven't made many motions today. Um, so I. And do you, do you want it, Kevin, just on the ACO adjustment or the yeah, whole? Yeah, just on the ACO okay. adjustment. I move we accept um, the staff recommendation of the, I'm going to actually do the accounting adjustment that in terms of how we discussed it before, the issue of the reserves and the health care reform investments. Okay. Is there any further discussion or questions? Or a second? Oh, that would be great. <laughs> Judy fell asleep and didn't correct me. I'll second it. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Oh, I meant aye. <laughs> I'm aye on that. Okay. So um, we resolved. Um, the first couple of questions. Yep. Is, is there a motion on the uh, rate in NPR? Or should we have discussion or motions? Well, you can discuss or move whatever you would like to do. Yeah, I, I would like to discuss this one a little bit. Um, I have a pretty strong rate <laughs> challenge on this one to be 0%. But when I look at it, um, this is a hospital that's doing really well. They've, um, you know, joining the network has been has been a benefit to them, and you know I know we've talked about them struggling, but I see that as in you know in 2015 they lost a million seven, in 2016 they lost. I mean they made a million five. Their total margin was 5.9. Their op margin was two. In 2017 they were 2.2. Their total margin was 2. Point, their total margin was 7.1. Their op margin was 2.7. <coughs> Going into this budget, they believed they were going to lose 203000 but 
they gained what I see as a bit of synergies with the hospital network, and they're actually now projecting 6.2% um, at operating margin and 6.8% at an operating loss, I mean operating, total operating margin. Their 2019 budget is coming in at 3.7% op margin, 4.1% total margin, with which I believe is, is a conservative uh, $2 million in for the reserve for the ACL. I, I know we accepted it, I'm okay with that, but you know, I believe some of that should, should go to the bottom line. Um, when we look at their history in, in rate, they've typically, uh, they were 5% in 2015, 5.3% in 2016, 5.3% in 2017, 3% in 2018. So, you know, I'm looking at this as, yes, you're, you're, they're doing well, um, but we need to look at hospitals that can come in and say, I don't need a rate increase. It would be about a million dollars it would knock them down to a 2.5% operating margin, a total margin of about 3.2, and again, with what I believe to be about $2 million in conservatism in there. So, um, you know, they join the network. You know, we should see the benefits of that. So I'm not trying to punish this hospital. I think they're doing a good job. Um, but I also think, you know, we need to look at at rate increases, and in, in past for other hospitals, we've given them zeros and negatives and things like that. So, you know, and, and we didn't do anything when they came in over in 2017 because we wanted to see how things were shaking out. So, that, you know, that's why I'm pushing to really go for a zero percent. I think it's because I'm looking at totality within the network and the synergies that they're getting, which, which they should get for their gettings on supplies, they're saving for supplies. But when that happens, when, do, when are we able to give that back to the ratepayers? And I think this is a case where we can. So that's why I was going for the zero. So Maureen, I think you've made an excellent argument about why it could be zero. And I'm just gonna offer a little bit of a contrarian opinion on this one in that I look at Porter as a hospital that's really almost a case study in leadership. And we saw um, Porter really struggle for a few years. And fortunately, someone stepped forward to take the helm that um, was able to get buy-in from all sectors of the uh, hospital community. Someone who, um, you know, was equally um, greeted by maintenance staff, nursing staff, um, provider staff, and this is an institution that is going to be going through a change again, um, unfortunately because um, time pressures um, have forced a, a decision not to continue in that leadership position. And I think that um, Yes, you could argue for the 0%, but I think they're on the right trend. If you take a look at that historical trend, um, moving down from closer to a 5% historical trend down to 2.8, I think is something that should be applauded and, and hopefully it continues to move in that direction in the future. So um, I would be willing to um, accept it as is. So I agree with everything that you just said, Kevin. Um, having uh, watched their day's cash on hand go from in the 30s uh, up to 133 over the past five to seven years and watch the loss in uh, primary care physicians be replaced. The, the margins are positive now and I think we can look at that as a, as a major positive trend in their, uh, in their trajectory there. Um, NPR is growing because more of the care is coming back into the community. We have more primary care providers in that community and the efficiencies that have been gained through the network affiliation are causing economies of scale, and yes, they're, they're creating margins now. Their day's cash on hand are still below the state average. They're all in and all three payers. A 2.8% commercial rate increase is medical inflation. That seems to me to be a reasonable rate request, and I think they're moving in all the right directions, and I would support uh, accepting their budget as given. Any discussion? 
Yes, um, my take on this is closer to uh, Maureen's. Um, I had kind of uh, worked my way into thinking that a um, reduction in the rate from 2.8% to 1.8% uh, was appropriate, but I could live with a 0% uh, increase. Um, I note that their margins have been improving since 2016, so it's not just a, a, a turn that her, happened last year, uh, but it, it, it goes back to the, the, the only negative was in 2015. Um, and then I'm looking at the distribution of the rate increase, and here again we have one that is heavily uh, weighted in terms of commercial. Um, of the total increase they're looking for, Porter's looking for, uh, 5.3 million of it is on, associated with the commercial payers. Um, a negative f uh, 541,000 uh, is associated with Medicaid payers, and a negative uh, 2 million 142,000 is uh, associated with um, Medicare payers. So, um, given that the burden is being aligned, and that's not necessarily where it will end up, but that's what the alignment is right now. Um, I thought a, a 295,000 cut, which is the 1%, would be appropriate. Um, uh, Maureen's proposal, if she makes it, would be uh, an $826,000 reduction on an $89 million budget, which is nine tenths of 1%, which uh, I don't think is that burdensome, uh, given given the healthy margins that this hospital has been generating for a few years now. <coughs> Um, for the reasons articulated by Kevin and Jess, I'm also um, comfortable with accepting the proposal of 3.2% NPR growth, which comes in at our target, and the 2.8% commercial rate increase at medical inflation. Um, I do think that um, another area of leadership that Porter has demonstrated is they were the first critical access hospital that jumped into the all-payer model um, for all three payers. Um, even though there's significant uncertainty about how all that works, quite frankly, as a critical access hospital, and they've taken a leadership role in working through that with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I think that um, as their fixed payments continue to grow, um, that they also are going to have to continue to uh, innovate. And now that they've achieved the economies of scale, that's going to be operational innovation, which I think could really provide a lot of leadership for other critical access hospitals. I would love a motion. I will move that we accept the Porter Medical Center proposed budget with the, we did the accounting adjustments and the, uh, everything else, right? So it's just the NPR growth of 3.2% with the adjustment and a 2.8% commercial rate increase. Second. It's been moved and seconded to um, accept the 3.2 adjusted uh, NPR growth rate and um, accept the 2.8% uh, Proposed rate increase. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Let me do that one again because I didn't hear, I don't think. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. So I believe that's a three to two vote. So the final hospital um, for discussion is the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, they're 19, well, first of all, they've requested the same accounting adjustment that the other two um, hospitals requested in the network. Their budget um, comes in at 1.28 billion. They are 48.8% of the system total. Um, without the adjustment, their NPR growth over a rebased budget would be 1.7%. Their NPR growth with the adjustment would be 1.1%. They've requested um, more than the 0.4% allowance in healthcare reform investments. The staff recommends approving uh, the, the investments at the rate of the 0.4% allowance. 
they're um, participating in all three ACO programs. Their rate request is 4%, and 1% um, increase um, on the commercial side is worth 4.5 million. So um, the adjustment, I'm presuming that the board will want to go the same way that you've gone with the other two hospitals. Healthcare reform investments, the staff is recommending acceptance at 0.4%. Um, uh, the NPR growth rate, yesterday's discussion included um, some, you know, concern or interest in um, the 1.7% or 1.1% if the adjustment, accounting adjustment is accepted given their historical um, NPR growth rates, which are quite a bit higher than that. Um, much of the discussion yesterday centered on the rates. Um, my notes show that um, we had four different rate proposals, 2%, 2.5%, 2.8%, and 3%. So, um, uh, and there was some discussion. The only difference in my notes is that I had it at uh, a 2%, a 3%, a 2.5%, and then two identical ranges of 2 to 2.8. Okay. I'll go with yours. Um, <laughs> so there was discussion also about, um, you know, maybe reducing the rate but not reducing the NPR because of um, the relatively low growth rate there based on, on history. So I'll stop there and let you discuss. Are there questions of staff? Okay, discussion? I'm, I'm inclined here to um, support the 1.7% uh, growth in NPR um, or as adjusted 1.1%, um, but I, I, I would like to see um, a rate reduction here. Um, again, uh, we have a proposal that is uh, obviously the largest hospital in Vermont and, and they have a, a, a big footprint and relative to uh, 2018 uh, projected to 2019 budget, uh, they're looking at a commercial increase of $16 million, um, um, and 18 of that, uh, in other words, I, I think their projections are based going down, but 18 of that is from the rate increase, um, and a uh, $1.7 million increase in Medicaid and a 9.9 .9 increase in, in Medicare. Uh, related to not so much affected by the rate. We're not at all, according to the uh, documentation, affected by the rate. So um, I could support a 2% redu reduction in the rate from 4% to 2%, which amounts to about $9 million, which would take their um, total margin down to 4.6% and their operating margin down to 2.2% and would uh, amount to 7 tenths of 1% of their uh, projected $1.273 billion budget. And again, as I did note yesterday, that that result is in the range of their projections of uh, having to do with the operating income, of the operating statement that they submitted as part of their uh, EPIC budget, um, where presentation where they projected uh, with EPIC uh, that uh, their uh, excess revenues over expenses would be um, about $61 million. So, my uh, ending uh, result is uh, totally consistent with, with, with that uh, projection, which was a year and a half ago. Um, but again, both their total margin remains very healthy with a 2% rate reduction, and uh, their operating margin remains healthy. And uh, this is a, a large, even with the reduction, hit on the commercial rate payers, which, as we know, in the end, falls to those who pay premiums. was the three yesterday um, I in I could come down to be in, more consistent with uh, where Jess and Maureen and Kevin are so maybe I'll just throw a motion out there and we'll see if it flies <laughs> um, unless people really want to say something else before I do that 
2.8. Yeah, I was at between 2 and 2.8. Yes. And I think Jess was yes. 2 to 2.8. And another thing just to add to what Tom's saying, um, their expense increases, if I look at their NPR growth, it's um, from, from um, their expense increases are coming in, whether we go budget or projection. And this one, you really need to almost look at projections since they were rebased. They're 2% on the NPR versus 2.8 on expenses. And that extra 0.8 is about um, eight or $9 million. So they're trending higher. Uh, we know they're putting in the Epic and Miller in here, but we also know that's not supposed to be going against ratepayers. Um, that was was part of the agreement there. So, you know, I'm along with Tom. You know, at two, I could maybe go a little bit higher to the 2.5, but you know, I definitely see um, the ability to have a rate cut here. Any other discussion or any motion? adjustment, the health care reform investments that we hold the NPR growth rate at 1.1% with that adjustment, and that we uh, introduce a, or allow for a commercial rate increase of 2.5%. Is there a second? I'll second it. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. So I believe that was unanimous. That would complete the review of all the hospital's budgets. Okay, do you have any words of wisdom to share with us before uh, I turn the mic over to some other board members? No, I just would like to thank all of you for your um, really diligent review of um, the information. Um, I'd like to thank the hospitals for their responsiveness to the many questions that we um, sent their way. Um, and uh, just, um, it was, a, I think, a thoughtful process. So thank you very much for that. So the real thanks need to go to you and the hospital budget team. I'll just say, Pat, that in your first year of leadership of the team, you have met and exceeded all expectations. And uh, so we're going to raise the bar for next year. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And many, many thanks to the entire team, Kelly, Lori, um, Tom, and Agatha. Um, just a tremendous group of colleagues, really. OK. With that, I know that uh, a few board members, or at least one board member, would like to uh, say a few things. So I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Holmes first. Um, th so I will echo that. Thank you to the you know to the entire team and actually to all the hospitals. I know we put a lot of hospitals through the ringer on this, and I actually would like to say one thing. Actually, reminded me, I, we're always about process improvement. So at some point in the future agenda, I would love to see. Let's talk about this process and think about how we can improve this process and streamline it and make it easier on all entities. So at some point, maybe Susan and Kevin thinking about a future budget date, a uh, future agenda date. But a couple of things that I wanted to propose to the board that we add um, to our standard budget orders based on some of the questions you probably heard me ask many of the hospitals. Um, and so I wanted to add language to every budget order that asks the hospitals to at least work with VITAL to explore the possibility of implementing the electronic consent uh, in their EHRs to add patient records to the VHI. Many of the hospitals seem to open to that possibility, so I guess I would like to have just language that asks the hospitals to start to have those conversations about those possibilities. Similarly, I'd like to add language to the budget orders for those hospitals that are participating in the ACO to have them explore the possibility of attributing their self insured employees to one care. Again, just exploring the possibilities. Not a mandate, but exploring those possibilities. And the other piece I think that came out of some of the healthcare advocates questioning 
that i would like to have our language be clear on if other board members agree to this is that language in the budget order should suggest that should say that the commercial rates that we've just decided are a ceiling um, that we fully expect negotiations to commence between hospitals and the carriers to reflect underlying costs and market rates for comparable services in other words we're not dictating rates this is a ceiling and so we still expect some conversations to occur between the carriers and the hospitals and so i want to make that clear in our budget language so I, I don't know if we need a motion for that or i just wanted to throw those three ideas out there Okay, so I will move <laughs> that we add language to each budget order that asks the hospitals to work with VITAL to explore the possibility of implementing electronic consent to add patient records to the VHI, add language to the budget orders for those hospitals participating in the ACO to explore the possibility of attributing their self-insured employees to one care, and making clear in the language in the budget order that these commercial rates are a ceiling and we expect negotiations to, con to continue between hospitals and carriers to the best of their abilities. I have a question about the enforceability of the last one. So when you're talking about the rates and if someone has a zero increase, I'm not sure um, if we would want to, um, if we're able to put that on as a, a cap necessarily or that it should be considered a ceiling and uh, make the language not um, mandatory because I, I'm concerned with Yes. Um, you mean the requiring negotiation as not mandatory, or? No, they, well, they, they should negotiate with that considered a ceiling, but I think that saying the language that it is a ceiling and that they may not um, go over, I think in some of these where we have a very low increase, that may be problematic. Do you have, what would you suggest for the language then? Considered to be Right, but I don't know if we, if when we are talking about some, if we're talking about say a zero increase or a very small increase as a ceiling, I, I am concerned with the ability to say that that's going to be the cap um, through negotiations. Um, there may be reasons it is not. Well, I hope that I'm not hearing you saying that there should there could be reasons why it would be exceeded, though, right? Um, well, you know, saying this broad language and saying it applies to all commercial rates, we have out-of-state insurance, we have um, other reasons that that might not be feasible. We can work with the language. Um, I think that you could say that it should... Um, should be considered a cap, and all efforts should be made to achieve that, but I, I would be concerned. That's fine. That, that language that you just described is fine. Okay, I, I would a actually ask for um, one more friendly amendment, in that um, one of your, one piece of your motion was um, an encouraging piece. There was no mandate whatsoever. Um, and that is the, the part of your motion that relates to encouraging hospitals to um, look at um, their self-insured uh, population. And you had limited that to those participating in the ACO. And I would just say that since it's just an encouraging piece, I would, I would uh, ask if you would consider a friendly amendment to encourage all hospitals to take a look at that. I accept that friendly amendment. Although I don't think we've had a second. I'll second. Okay. With all those friendly amendments. Okay. <laughs> Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Is there any other board member who wishes? Tom. Yes, I, I would just like to underscore um, my. Uh, concerns about uh, the, the cost shift and uh, just a th three or four quick points I'd like to make as we went through this process we started uh, the process by looking for 80 million dollars in additional NPR 
and only 3.9% of that was proposed to us uh, for Medicaid by hospitals. 76% was a pr was a proposal for commercial insurance, which means premium payers, and 20% um, was uh, associated with Medicare. So clearly here, even in the increments that we're dealing with on, on top of a very $2.6 million billion base, the increments uh, underscore that the cost shifts exist. And I think in the long run, the cost shift uh, can have some very uh, uh, bad uh, outcomes beyond those uh, which uh, already exist. Uh, we've seen from hospital presentations that it influences bad debt and free care. We know that it causes high commercial insurance rates. And I worry about it affecting the all-payer model and our efforts on reform in one care if we have a bunch of premium payers that, um, you know, are just, you know, with their pitchforks concerned about the high premiums they're paying as, as a percent of income. And so as we head into the next uh, budget season uh, uh, with the state, um, I just want to note that if you go back to 2017 through 2019, the increases in Medicare uh, and in, in Medicaid have, have been at a seven-tenths of one percent growth rate. Um, and uh, that clearly is not enough to keep pace with even uh, background inflation, much less uh, medical inflation. Um, and yet, the, in the last uh, session, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Joint Fiscal Office showed that there was a $78 million surplus um, that was moved into the Human Services Caseload Reserve, which would be, uh, which is significant. Um, so um, I'm hoping that uh, we can work, or the hospitals and, and VASA can work, um, in the in the legislature to at least get uh, um, uh, appropriations associated with Medicaid to keep pace with inflation. The money is there; it doesn't. Taxes don't have to be raised to do it, um, and uh, I think it would just calm the waters uh, as we move to 2022 and and the conclusion of the all payer model. So I just want to uh, conclude with the, this morning, at least, since we are going to adjourn till 1 o'clock uh, this afternoon to talk about a different subject. I just want to say that um, one of the more poignant points in the hospital budget hearing for me was the testimony from the lady who had had uh, surgery at Central Vermont Medical Center, and it really brought home the fact that why I think this board is here, which is to try to make sure that Vermonters have affordable care. And I think that uh, all of us, including the hospitals, have to uh, further discussion on how we can make it more affordable for people who are struggling to pay their bills and yet are in life-threatening situations. So I think that uh, this board will take some criticism for looking at um, rate increases but I'm not going to apologize for that. I think it's the proper role of this board. I think it's a role that was definitely intended by the legislature in creating this board. And so I think that, um, at least myself, I'm very proud of the way this process has been conducted this year. I'm proud of the, the GMCB team and proud of my fellow board members. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn till 1 o'clock? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. To uh, <laughs> resume our meeting from this morning. And the first item on the agenda this afternoon is um, a presentation from Team Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so Kakua or Sarah, whichever one of you is going to start it off. Sure, I'll uh, kick it off here. So um, this is a... Uh, we're trying to do a better job of providing information. And this is like, I don't know what you call the appetizer to an appetizer of a more comprehensive decomposition analysis. Um, this is just kind of a very targeted look at a set of very consistent um, procedure codes over time to kind of introduce some of the challenges that we're going to have when we're trying to um, do a more comprehensive analysis. So uh, this is going to feature Kukua. It's really all her work. And uh, yeah, super proud of what she's been putting together. 
Okay, so when we talk about the decomposition, looking over the office visit that we have, there are some few questions that <laughs> there are some few questions that come into mind that we would like to think about. So, firstly, probably we would like to think about uh, outputs, um, outpatient visit utilization rate changing over time. Do we have the length of visits also changing over time? The other question that one could ask him or herself is how are prices changing over time? So thus, is the insurer paid amount changing over time and what about the member responsibility amounts to? Lastly, one could probably say that do the payer types probably differ because of the changes that we see over time? So to analyze the office visits over time, we first look at the evaluation and management codes that we have using the CPT codes. Basically, it's divided into two groups. There's the new patient and the established patient. But in 2014, we had Medicare changing over to just a single code to represent all the patient types that they have. So be it a new patient or an established patient, they just use the single code. And with a CPT code, usually you can tell the length of visits in the office. By just using the one code as a G code, you can't really tell if the office visit length was five minutes, 10 minutes, or 45 minutes over the time. And we are going to decompose it into three main components. That's the utilization, which we refer to it as the office visit per member per year or office visit per member over the time period. Then we'll look at price, that's the changes that we see in the insurer paid amount and the member responsibility. Lastly, we have the intensity rate, that's the typical office visit length that a member receives during the hospital visit, clinic, or the facility visit that he or she attends. We have five major payers that we are looking at. So the major players are Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicare Advantage. But when it comes to commercial payers, we did split it into two. So we look at the fully insured plans and the self-funded plans. Our analysis mainly is based on the claims database that we have. That's what we call the VCARES. And this, this slide shows the overall population that we have from 2012 to 2016 by payer. If we look at the table, we could see that over the year, between 2012 and 2015, our average population was about 570,000 per year, but 2016 would see a slight decrease from 570,000 per year to about 497,000 per year. This will be visualized on the next slide. So our next slide shows the um, average memberships that we have for each pair. That's the bar graphs that we have. And the um, straight line on top, the black straight line on top, represent the total population over time. So we can see that there's a slight increase in the total population over time from 2012 to 2015, but we see a decrease in 2016. This was actually probably due to the Gobe decision that happened in 2016, and we lost about 46% of our membership, and mainly it was with the self-funded plans. So our first decomposition looks at the office visits over time from 2012. So just to be clear, what we're talking about is that um, it doesn't track with the, the population of the state as a whole. It's really the, the population that we're talking about are those that are submitting the data. Yes. Yeah. So our first decomposition looks at the utilization rate or office visits for the time period 2012 to 2016. If we look at the graph, we observe that there was a slight increase over time from 2012 to 2016 for about four visits per member per year to about five visits per member per year by the end of 2016. Our second part of the office visit decomposition looks at the office visits per member per year, but then by payer type. So we have the payer type as Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, then fully insured and self-funded plans. For the total office visit for the fully insured and self-funded plans, it's remained constantly stable over time with approximately three visits per member per year. So that's the first two bottom lines that we see on the screen. For Medicaid plans, it was also consistent from 2012 to 2014 for of about four visits per member 
per year, but in 20, between 2015 and 2016, the total office visits per member per year increased to about five visits per year. For Medicare Advantage, that's the third line or the light blue line that we see. The office visits likely dipped in 2014, but after that, we saw a rise in the office visits per member per year. Last but not the least, if we look at the Medicare patient, that's the green line or the topmost line that we have, the total office visits for each beneficiary increased up from 2012 onwards from about eight visits per member per year to about nine visits per member per year by 2016. Just to interrupt for a moment, keep in mind that um, there's nothing special to say. This is a post-operative office visit. You know, it's an office visit is an office visit, so you wouldn't want to look at this and say this is equal to primary care. Our next major decomposition looks at the prices or the average prices between 2012 and 2016. This first graph represents the average price for, the, for what the insurer pays and the average member responsibility shared amount. So the very first line at the bottom, that's the red or the pinkish line, represent the average member shared amount. And the average paid amount is represented by the blue line. For the average member shared amount, we did see an increase of approximately $16 to $17 from 2012 to 2014. And in 2016, this average shared amount decreased to about $14 per member over time. Similarly, if we look at the average paid amount, it did increase in 2013 to approximately $64 in 2013, but in 2012, it was around $61. Between 2014 and 2016, the average paid amount decreased from $64 to $58. Our next slide also looks at the average price for the by payer type, but this time around, we are looking at the average allowed amount by payer type. So the allowed amount here represents what the insurer, the sum of what the insurer pays and the member responsibility. So for the average um, allowed amount for the fully insured plans, we saw an increase over time. That's the red line. That's the second from second from the top. The average allowed amount for the self-funded plan also did increase from 2012 to 2015, but then in decreased in 2016. This is likely due to the Kobe decision that we had in 2016. But then by 2016, we realized that the self-funded and fully insured plans were the same. The average allowed amount were the same as compared to the earlier years from 2012 to 2015, where the self-funded average allowed amount was way higher than even the fully insured plans. So the, looking at just the average member responsibility, excluding what the payer pays, just the member responsibility over time from 2012 to 2016, the cost sharing for Medicaid and Medicare plans remained relatively stable. That's the first two bottom lines that we have. But we see more variability in the Medicare Advantage plans, that's the light blue or the third line from the bottom. But the average member shared amount increased at a similar rate for self-funded and fully insured plans from 2012 to 2014. Then the average cost sharing for the self-funded plans or members with the self-funded plans, we see a decline from 2012 to 2016 and this will probably be to the good decision that we saw in 2016. So yeah, the self-funded who are still around are a pretty distinct subset. Um, they're governmental plans, such as the state of Vermont employees that don't have the option not to submit their claims to be cures. So if you look at these trends, even though the fully insured were paying uh, you know, a higher uh, price, uh, the member responsibility, or lower price rather, the member responsibility has historically been higher until we've kind of winnowed it down to this um, subset where we're seeing some definite changes in the population. So just want to be clear, that's going to be a big challenge in any kind of longitudinal uh, look we take at these numbers. Sorry to interrupt. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you be able to pull those out of the history and only show that? So. Yeah, uh, so it, it, it's uh, 
possible but a little bit tricky because there's not really always a clean way to be like this is a governmental plan without an ERISA exemption. <laughs> uh, so, but you know, looking at group names, we can certainly identify like state employees, uh, most of the um, educational plans. Um, and you know similar governmental plans, but it's not going to be perfect. But you know that's one. Because it may show a different line. Right. 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 Well, and what you just said makes a lot of sense, given sort of the actuarial value of those plans, which tend to be higher than the marketplace. Our last decomposition looks at the intensity over time. That is the typical visit length each member receives at the hospital per year. Since Medicare decided to use just one code in 2014 to represent all its visits, whether a new patient or an established patient, and how long the visit takes is just one code, we can't really determine if the office visit was probably five minutes or 10 minutes or even 60 minutes. <clears throat> Sorry. We did take it out from the intensity measurement. So we don't have Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans with this um, analysis. And also the code for the G code is also taken out. So this includes just the commercial plans that are fully insured and the self-insured and Medicaid plans. So over time, we saw that there was a slight increase from 2012 to 2015 in the visit length per member, but then a slight decrease when, it, when we got to 2016. As I said, we did take Medicare and Medicare Advantage out because of their single coding in 2014. So looking at pay intensity by payer type, we do not have results for Medicare and Medicare Advantage. So beneficiaries with Medicaid plans, that's the topmost that we have, the topmost line, that's the green. They had the highest office visit length per member amongst other payers over time. And then the Medicaid, Medicaid plans or members with a Medicaid visit length also increased about five minutes between 2014 and 2016. So initially it was around about 74 minutes per member per year to about 79 visits, um, visit length per member per year. Also the visit length increase for commercial plans does the fully insured and um, self-funded plans. But with the fully insured plans, we did see a slight longer average length in recent years. So the self-funded plans or the self I'm sorry, the fully insured plans, it's being represented by the red line. And the self-funded plans, it's being represented by the blue line. To summarize all that we've seen or observed in our analysis, there are a few questions that we, we posed in the beginning and what did we really see? So our outpatient visit utilization rates changing over time. Yes, we did see that the utilization has been increasing steadily since 2012, but then it's been driven by Medicare. Rates observed for Medicaid and commercial plans also relatively remain stable over the, over the time. The other question was, are the length of visit also changing over time? We did observe that Medicaid and commercial plans showed increases in typical visit length of about five minutes from 2014 to 2016. Then Medicare intensity, we can't measure it from 2014 to 2016 because of the code change that we had. But then we could probably have other measures to measure it, but it becomes a challenging. And it's a great example that we will see that if we have the payment re reforms, when measuring changes, it becomes a bit of a challenge. Hashtag competition. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not the least, how are prices changing over time? That's what the insurer is paying and the member responsibility. Medicare did show relatively stable allowed amount over time. The average Medicaid allowed amount showed the most variability over time. Then changes in average cost appeared similar for commercial plans, that's the fully insured and the self-funded plans. But then the self-funded plans demonstrated higher average allowed cost prior to 2016. The Gobert decision changed the population of the self-funded plans reporting to VQs, and this remains a challenge when we have to measure any changes over time. 
Last but not the least, our next step to further add decompose our results is to expand the decomposition to include medical services by categories such as inpatient, outpatient, and pharmacy, and also include variables to account for changes in demographics, e.g. age or gender. So for the age, for instance, we could probably try and see if at the younger population member responsibility going up than the older population or vice versa, and also to include disease prevalence. Some diseases might be more expensive over time than the other. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, are there questions for Kukua? Uh, yes, I have one question. So um, as we move forward uh, through the all-pair model, my recollection is that there's some sort of a flag now in VCures to identify ACO populations, so we might be able to kind of compare between groups. Is that reasonable, or is that high in the sky? <laughs> I would say that would be reasonable, but depending on how everything goes and how the result looks like. Thank you. Well, this is getting, this is interesting stuff. I mean, and you can see it's going to get more and more interesting as time goes on. Uh, yes. Good job. Thank uh, you. A couple of quick questions are on the second or third slide where background population um, is, I'm just trying to figure out to give those bottom line numbers some context. It, would the bottom line numbers be the population of the state of Vermont if everybody, if this was an, an all-in analysis? No way, who are we missing? Uninsured, federal employees, um, yeah, so. Military. Yeah. Military. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and also, um, so one of the, so in order to help preserve the risk of re-identifying people, all the live identifiers, such as the um, what we call clear text name, has been um, hashed prior to its being encrypted. And if your algorithm's any good, J-O-H-N will look nothing like J-O-N. So doing any sort of fuzzy matching is impossible. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, we're positive that we have too many identities in VCures. So they do their best to try and cluster people both over time and across payers to one ID, but given the limitations of that, um, it, it's certainly imperfect. So this is gonna be an overestimate of the true number of people that are represented in the claims mm -hmm. database. And so uh, in terms of the, the payer type, where would free care or bad debt fit into this? Uh, th we do not have those claims today. Um, other states have dealt with this by trying to incorporate what they often call pseudo claims. So they try and mimic what you would see for uninsured or uncompensated or self-pay care. But to get that utilization, I would highly recommend the hospital discharge data set, which is a true census of care delivered at a hospital. Thank you. I think you lost me when you said hashed prior to encryption. <laughs> I had a question on how the time of visits is measured, and um, you know, I know if I if, if I look to myself, you know, you get pulled into the room and then you sit there for a while, <laughs> and then the nurse comes in and then they leave and then you sit there for a while. <laughs> Don't quote me on any of that. And then, uh, you know, and then at the end of the day, you know, you might be there for an hour, but you actually saw the doctor for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So I was kind of surprised at the 50 minutes and 80 minutes from a time and just wondered, you know, how is that measured? Because it's certainly I'm there that long, and I know there's other steps have to take place. But Right. That's a great question. And to be clear, in the CPT manual, it's like a typical visit length. So it's kind of supposed to be a proxy for the intensity of care. but. Um, one of my kind of pipe dreams is to, I think I've heard Mike Del Trucco talk about the triangle of validation and really sit down with someone who submits the claim from the provider side, someone who processes the claim from the insurer side, and see where VCURES comes within that triangle to figure out exactly that sort of scenario. Because um, administrative data is not the same as a, as a medical record. Like, yeah, and that's a perfect example of one of the challenges. And then um, to add to what Tom was talking about, I, I like this chart. I know you, you're saying there's some double counting. And I understand that. But, you know, if we went to 2016, you know, it shows about 40% of the population are kind of in the insured world. And then, you know, kind of 30 to, to a little under 30 between the Medicaid and Medicare Advantage. And um, I know this isn't representative of what we see in the hospital budgets per se, but certainly the costs when we see how that's paid out. 
the insured, pe this you know, insured and self-insured is paying so much more of the way, if you will, you know, to kind of talk about the cost shift there. Um, so it's kind of interesting to track that too. Um, can you go to page nine for a second? Um, on this one, I had a little bit. So is the second line from the top? That's the insured, ins insured fully insured, because. I know you guys, your summary takeaway was kind of that it was, was they were all moving pretty similarly, but I see more of an upward slope in the commercial line and a little more of a downward slope, certainly in the Medicaid line and, and a flat. So, I mean, my observation would probably be a little bit different that the, you know, the commercial, other than the self-insured, where I know there's some things going on there because the population changed. Um, and I'm thinking if we hadn't changed that population, the self-insured last bubble probably would have been trending up too. So only because, you know, we're talking about in other ways, cost shift and things going up and it, you know, it seems like things are fairly stable, but just looking at those costs too are interesting to see, you know, the hundred plus dollars charged on the commercial side versus the $50 on the Medicaid side, and if we ever were able to start marrying up their actual expenses to those costs, you know, knowing that there's not a lot of profit throughout the system, you know, it really would show the, the costs probably are, you know, somewhere around the blue line and, and the difference, you know, where we're are being subsidized for the Medicaid, the Medicare, and then, you know, paid out on the other side. So, you know, I know we don't know that profit piece, but, or the expense piece, but it's, it's certainly gonna fall above, I would think, the yellow and green line. So, it's very refreshing to see something that's 2016 versus 2012, which is what we were looking at for a number of years, and I was wondering if you might wanna share with not only the board, but with the public, what changes have occurred that have allowed us to get more timely information? And what do you see going forward? So for example, when do you think we'll be looking at 2017? Sure, um, and to be honest, we, uh, we could have included 2017 today. Uh, one of the challenges there is that's the first year of the ACO pilot with Medicaid, and we're still trying to figure out a, a meaningful way to deal with um, shadow claims and true costs. and that's all kind of contingent on the settlement um, and the final numbers coming out of that program. So uh, the changes though, I think are largely due to capacity. So we finally have an in-house uh, data team that is um, getting up to speed on how to directly use our claims database. Um, we've also had some improvements in the timeliness of the Medicare data, which was a big leg in the past, especially for um, the expenditure analysis. So uh, to get a final action claim for Medicare, I think it's, Eight, 15 months of run out at this point before they'll even deliver that file. Um, but we're able to get quarterly extracts uh, these days and we're further trying to accelerate that timeline uh, by a d different delivery mechanism with our vendor. So uh, yeah, so. So if somebody asked me the question, I would say the biggest change is that we have Sarah Lindbergh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more Kakua, honestly, and David and Kate. In the, entire, <laughs> In the yeah. entire A team, that's yeah. right. But there wouldn't be an entire A team if it wasn't for Sarah. Susan Barrett, I think, was the. Oh, yeah. Is the um, quarterly extract directly related to the agreement with the feds and the government? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and you know, we welcome feedback if this type of thing is helpful. And like I said, this is like the pre-appetizer to a much more in-depth uh, analysis. But you know, a lot of the challenges aren't going to go away, and. For instance, we know that, or we think that the, the PMPM for the self-funded overall, not for office visits, probably went up by 100 bucks. So I think this is a higher utilizing population left. So that's gonna be a major consideration in anything that we're looking at. Okay. Anything else from the board? Okay, at this point, I'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Pretty quiet afternoon. Okay, thank you very much. And again, thank you for uh, the great strides that have been made in your tenure here. And uh, uh, 
keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So um, that is the only item that we had on the agenda for this afternoon. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. It's a much earlier day than uh, we had anticipated. And just a reminder, in case anybody um, had forgotten it, but tonight is the memorial for Con Hogan at uh, Vermont College starting at uh, 530. So hopefully we'll see some friendly faces there.